My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. Feel your max with Brooks Running and the all-new Ghost Max 2. They're the shoes you deserve, designed to streamline your stride and help protect your body. Treat yourself to feel-good landings on an ultra-high stack of super-comfy nitrogen-infused cushion that takes the edge off every step, every day. The Brooks Ghost Max 2. You know, technically, they're a form of self-care. Brooks, let's run there. Head to brooksrunning.com to learn more. This is Optimal Health Daily. Alcohol and Anxiety. Does Drinking Really Help You Relax? By Tonya Lester of tonyalester.com. And I'm Dr. Neil Malik reading you some of the most popular health and fitness blogs out there with permission from the websites and always with a bit of my commentary at the end. I'm gonna keep this intro nice and short, so let's get right to the post as we optimize your life. Alcohol and Anxiety. Does Drinking Really Help You Relax? By Tonya Lester of tonyalester.com. Announcing you need a drink when feeling stressed or worn out is usually met with enthusiastic agreement. Many of us take for granted that drinking eases anxiety and helps us relax in social settings or at the end of a hard day. But lately, it seems like our entire society might be developing a bit of a drinking problem. When rosé all day is printed on fitness wear and so-called wine moms are said to have influenced presidential elections, it's worth looking at whether drinking is doing what we think it's doing. Does alcohol really take the edge off our stressful days, or does it make things worse? According to a recent study released by the RAND Corporation and supported by the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, drinking soared since the pandemic. Heavy drinking, for those that identified as female, has increased by 41%. Michael Pollard, lead author of the study and a sociologist at RAND, told ABC Television, quote, The magnitude of these increases is striking. People's depression increases, anxiety increases, and alcohol use is often a way to cope with these feelings. But depression and anxiety are also the outcomes of drinking. It's this feedback loop where it just exacerbates the problem that it's trying to address. End quote. If you are truly drinking moderately, which the National Institute of Health defines as one five-ounce glass of wine or one 12-ounce beer for those identified as female at birth, and two for those identified as male at birth, and alcohol doesn't have a noticeable effect on your overall mood or sleep, you are probably staying clear of alcohol's anxiety-elevating effects. But if you are more than a one-and-done drinker or are worried that alcohol is affecting your well-being and health, it's worth looking at how it is affecting you. Alcohol in the brain. Alcohol has a biphasic or two-phase effect on the brain. It both increases dopamine levels, leading to feelings of euphoria, and inhibits excitatory neurotransmitters, which slows down your brain functioning. The slowing down of the excitatory neurotransmitters is how alcohol acts as a depressant. Once dopamine levels go back to normal, we're still left with a depressed system, which often leads to another drink to get the dopamine levels back up. The more we drink, the less effect alcohol has on our dopamine receptors, but by then, our brain has learned to crave alcohol when we're stressed. This interference with our neurotransmitters can increase anxiety, often for the entire day after drinking. This can lead to wanting a drink the next evening to wind down, causing the entire cycle to start over again. Very often, cutting out alcohol can lead to a significant decrease in your overall anxiety. Alcohol and your sleep. While the sedative effect of alcohol initially might help us fall asleep, as little as one drink too close to bedtime can wreak havoc on both the quality and quantity of your sleep. Alcohol interferes with our sleep stages, especially REM sleep, the restorative part of our sleep cycle. When alcohol finally leaves your bloodstream, you're often jolted awake as your nervous system, coming off of several hours in a depressed state, tries to achieve homeostasis, 
by lurching into active mode. Sleep is the ultimate self-care activity. The importance of quality sleep and all mental health issues and overall well-being cannot be overstated. It is the first line of defense against chronic anxiety and depression. Researcher Matthew Walker, author of the excellent book, Why We Sleep, says it perfectly. Quote, The best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. End quote. Midnight ruminating, 3 a.m. wake-ups, night sweats, morning headaches, and brain fog are all signs that alcohol is impacting your sleep and bringing along the anxiety you are trying to avoid. Do you have a problem? We often have a binary way of thinking about alcohol use. Either you're an alcoholic and your drinking is truly out of control, or there's no problem at all. But that isn't an accurate picture. Most people who drink too much are not addicted and wouldn't experience what we typically think of as withdrawal if they stopped. They don't need treatment or intervention. In fact, it's likely no one around them is worried about their drinking at all. But from a mental health perspective, alcohol is still affecting them negatively. A friend recently shared that her husband expressed concern that her drinking had increased rapidly over the course of quarantining. She told him, I know I've been drinking too much. This is what I do instead of taking an antidepressant. Imagine your doctor suggesting you take a medication that will help with anxiety for about 30 minutes, then will make your anxiety worse. Alcohol can be highly addictive. It can also lead to sleep problems, depression, headaches, stomach issues, infertility, and birth defects. Further, it markedly increases your susceptibility to many types of cancer. It's associated with reckless behavior and blackouts and is responsible for more than 95,000 deaths in America or 3 million deaths worldwide each year. Hopefully, you would find a new doctor. Alcohol as medication is a terrible idea. If your drinking is medicinal, it's time to look for safer, more effective ways to cope. Here are some steps to take if you'd like to shift your alcohol use. 1. Get real about how much you're actually drinking. Bringing attention to our habits is always the first step in changing them. Next time you're drinking, use a measuring cup to pour out 5 ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or 1.5 ounces of spirits or hard liquor. That's one drink. Do this with every drink you have to keep yourself honest. In a notebook, keep track of how many drinks you have each day and rate your overall anxiety, depression, and sleep quality. 2. Find other ways to relax. The ritual of signifying the end of the day by sitting down with a drink is hard to give up unless we have an enticing alternative. Identify when you will most want a drink and think about what you could do instead. Swapping in a non-alcoholic drink that you reserve for happy hour can often stand in effectively for alcohol. Reading a book, taking a bath, connecting with a loved one, or even just going to bed early are all proven anxiety relievers. And three, take a break. Dry Uary is right around the corner and there are countless free or low-cost programs online to offer support and guidance to anyone wanting to take an alcohol timeout. Not drinking at all for at least a month is the best way to see how alcohol is affecting your life and to decide whether it's worth it. Be aware that the more you're drinking now, the longer it will take your body to truly reset and for you to feel the full impact of going without. A good rule of thumb is one month for every daily drink. If that feels intimidating, start smaller and see if you can add on as you move ahead. Ideally, keep the timeline open. The idea of a drinking break is to diminish drinking's importance in your life. If you are counting the days until you can drink again, it will have the opposite effect. If you decide to reintroduce drinking after this period, keep in mind that all habits grow. In the same way, we might grow an exercise habit by starting with 15 minutes a day, one daily drink can easily become three without our noticing. Drinking mindfully for the long term will likely require a lot of attention and periodic reassessment. None of today's suggestions replace treatment or a 12-step program. If you experience strong resistance to any of these steps, it's worth getting curious about the role of alcohol in your life and whether this is how you want to live. While certain people are natural moderators who never drink more than the suggested amount, the truth is, most people who drink consistently will eventually need to reevaluate the way they are drinking. There shouldn't be shame or stigma about wanting to slow down or stop drinking because needing to do so isn't the exception, it's the rule. 
You just listened to the post titled, Alcohol and Anxiety, Does Drinking Really Help You Relax? by Tonya Lester of tonyalester.com. And I'll be right back with my commentary. Dr. Neil here for my commentary. Now, what about the potential health benefits we may be hearing about consuming alcohol? For example, you may have heard that drinking wine regularly may reduce our risk of certain diseases, like having a heart attack or suffering a stroke. There are over 100 published, well-designed studies that have found that consuming alcohol regularly may decrease a person's risk for having a heart attack. Now, before we go out and celebrate this news with a drink, there are some things we need to remember about these studies. Drinking regularly assumes drinking in moderation. Remember from today's article, Tonya mentioned that for those that were identified as female at birth, one drink means no more than one 5-ounce glass of wine or one 12-ounce beer each day. For those that were identified as male at birth, that means no more than two 5-ounce glasses of wine or two 12-ounce beers each day. If we consume more alcohol than this or try and catch up on all of the alcohol we miss during the week on weekends, our disease risk increases, meaning risk for heart attack goes up, risk for having a stroke goes up, risk for liver problems increases, and so does the risk for all types of cancer. So, there is a sweet spot when it comes to alcohol consumption, but there are also those that should probably stay away from alcohol altogether and ignore these studies, like those that are pregnant, or those with a history of addiction, or a family history of addiction. Oh, and something else I'll mention, What if we start drinking, in the U.S., exactly when we turn 21? If we start drinking when we're 21, then the benefits should last a lifetime, right? Not so much. The potential health benefits of, like, lower risk for having a heart attack or stroke only seem to kick in after the age of 40. So it doesn't actually help if we were to start drinking earlier in our lifetimes. But let's quickly go back to the benefits. If you consume alcohol in moderation, and it's not negatively affecting your life, you feel good, you're able to sleep well, and so on, then by all means, enjoy. All right, that'll do it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow for our usual Friday Q&A, so definitely stay tuned for that, where your optimal life awaits.